Well, good morning. Welcome to Crosswinds. Am I on there, Abdu? I am. Am I coming through? I am now? Okay, good. Well, again, good morning. Uh, I'm sure you guys can hear me, but I was concerned for the people online. Whether you are here today with us this morning or whether you're watching online, I am just so glad that you are here with us. You matter to us and you matter to God. And if we haven't met before, my name is Ken, and I serve as the, the pastor here at Crosswinds. You know, we had a wonderful event this past weekend with our teens and their friends and, and some teens from other churches. We had hosted 27 students overnight for our end of summer hangout. There was a lot of fun playing Hawaiian kickball, bubble baths at the end, and big swimming pools, and uh, water balloon fights. Over a thousand water balloons were damaged. Um, none of the kids were. And... Uh, uh, Super Soaker Water Fights and ZNA did a great job uh, leading us in worship. And Daniel Good came all the way up from um, down at U of I area, uh, Champaign, and uh, preached the gospel hard and tough for the kids, and, and they were blessed by his teaching. Um, Fourteen of our adults came here and, and served our students and, and selflessly stayed up all night and, and worked hard. People like Mark and Ian and, and Gene and, and uh, Eric and, and Steve. And uh, um, we had some great leaders and Abdu and Cleone that sacrificed much time and much sleep this week. And, and while the youth seem all charged up again on all the donuts you fed them this morning, some of us leaders are dragging a bit, okay? <laughs> We're not as young as we used to be. But we had a great time with the kids. Uh, today we are on the final message of our Hot Topic series where you, the church, picked out the messages that I would preach. And today's message is called Introspection. And the question asked for today comes from the mind of one of our teens. The, 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 the question was self-confidence versus self-consciousness. You know, friends, being a teen is is very difficult. You're becoming an adult, but you don't feel very confident as you navigate the dramatic changes that are going on in your body, in your life's purpose, in your relationships, all these new relationships. Um, a lot of new uh, relationships are happening among our teens, and they're trying to navigate that. It's a, it's a, it's a difficult time, and, and you feel very self-conscious all the time, wondering what other people are thinking because other people's opinions seem to matter so much. And you're starting to look like an adult, and yet there are rules and expectations for you that make you, again, feel like a kid. It, it often seems like everything you say or, or do is wrong, and, and you're not even sure why some of the times. And sometimes you act confident when you have no reason to be because you don't want to admit to anybody, and even yourself, you really don't know what you're doing. Can yeah, teens relate to that? Parents? Self-confidence is often a thing teens do, and, and, and we do, to mask our insecurities in life. See, the, the problem with both self-confidence and self-consciousness is that word self. It's good to be confident. It's good to be competent in things you do. It's also good to be aware of your weaknesses and your strengths so that you perform well in the tasks that you're responsible for. But the problem is that we think and we are taught that we are going to find our value in ourselves by being self-confident in ourselves. That, that's where we find value. And in September, we're going to start a series in the book of Ephesians called who God says you are. You know, teens and, and all of us are struggling to find value for ourselves in life. And, and friends, I want to say something to you. I used to say to my teens, it's very important. This, this whole series in the fall we're going to be doing is you're not who you think you are. And you are not who others say you are. You are who God is says you are. You're going to be hearing that a lot over the next few weeks. We're going to spend 18 months renewing our mind from false values that this world puts on us that make us feel self-conscious 
and often take away our confidence when we feel we don't quite measure up. And the the problem is that we're using the wrong measuring stick, the values of this world, instead of what God values. See, our world loves self-confident people. The ones that seem to succeed in life are, are, are those politicians or those actors or those sports athletes who seem so, so confident in themselves. The, the cocky ones, the arrogant ones, are the ones that seem to get attention and become our cultural heroes. And our, our children sometimes try to imitate them because they, they see that that's maybe the way to go. And our educators and our, our psychologists promote the idea that it's good for us to have a strong self-esteem. But most of them come from a worldview, the ones promoting that, that says, you're a cosmic accident. You are a a result of a bunch of biological mutations over billions of years. And yet you should be confident and have great self-esteem. And and you should work hard and, and stand above all the other biological mutations around you. Hey, teens, be, be confident in yourselves, even though your lives have no real meaning or, or no, no, no real purpose beyond yourselves and your own pleasure. You see, that's the message they're getting every day when they walk into their schools and throughout their lives and with their friends. Beloved, true confidence in life does not come from self. It comes from a God who lovingly created you. And if you look for confidence for within yourselves, you may end up having an arrogant, cocky confidence if you're doing well compared to the other biological accidents. But as soon as your success in whatever area fails, you will falter because you're not operating based on his grace, but on your own performance. The Bible says in both James 4, 6 and 1 Peter 5, 5, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The self-confidence the world sells does not last because it's based on your ability to perform and honestly to dominate others. And and because self-confidence ultimately focuses on oneself, it's the enemy of truly healthy relationships with others. This cultural value of self-confidence has led us to a lot of narcissism in our world today. A study published in 2008 found that uh, there's a narcissistic personality inventory which is used to measure narcissistic tendencies. And it it showed an increase of about 30% in our young adults from the early 80s to 2000. And six. In her book, Generation Me, psychologist Jean Twinch argues that millennials, those born between 1980 and 1990s, exhibit higher levels of narcissism compared to previous generations. See, they grew up in an era where self-confidence was the dominant value in their culture. My own children got big trophies in every sport and activity they did, not because they accomplished anything great, We told them they were great no matter what they did, didn't we? Those trophies didn't make them feel valued. They just later filled landfills. Children didn't care about those trophies. They were tossed aside because there was no real work or sacrifice that gave them a sense of value in life. So we we tried to build their sense of self-esteem based on Nothing special, a a trophy for doing nothing instead of telling them that they were God's treasure just because he created them. You know, surveys of of college students have shown a decline in empathy and an increase in self-reported narcissistic traits over the past few decades. A study from 2010 found that American college students in 2009 were 40% less empathetic than their counterparts. Is that where... A focus on self-confidence and self-esteem lead us? The current Gen Z generation is the most unchurched generation. They are self-confident. They're also one of the most confident generations. But they're very lost. 80 million have no relationship to God at all. 
And God is the one that brings us true confidence. But as a culture, we have, we've tried to build their self-confidence through self, not through God. The modern Western approach is looking within to find our identity and our purpose. People are encouraged to explore their inner feelings and desires and passions to define who they are. And, and this is reflected in cultural mantras like, be true to yourself, follow your heart, be you. Here's the problem. The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things and is desperately sick, and who can understand it? Jeremiah 17, 9. How can we, we be confident when our confidence based on self, which is a liar. We're, we're confident in a liar. A liar that makes us fear and, and doubt our value constantly. Parents today are afraid to give boundaries or, or, or discipline to their children because it might damage their precious little self-esteems. And they wonder why their child becomes unproductive or, or selfish or not kind to other or rejects them. The Bible says this, train a child in the way he should go and even when he is old, he will not depart far from it. Proverbs 22, 6. A child needs to be trained not to follow their heart, but to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit according to the word and the character of our Lord. Confidence in their lives will come in the truth, not in the lies their heart is telling them. You know, we have youth functions, and our kids don't get signed up until last minute because parents are often more concerned about how their kids feel about going instead of training them that feelings matter less than doing what is right and good. You know, my mom used to sign me up for things that were good for me because she loved me. And she knew better what was good for me than my own heart did when I was a teen. A teenage heart is, is raging with all kinds of emotions. Some of them are true, some of them are false, and it's our job as parents to help them see the truth in their emotions and not to submit to the emotions that are lying to them we have a false view in our culture that the children are good and they become bad through their environment. But that's not what the Bible says. David, a man known to be after God's own heart, said this about himself. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Psalm 51, 5. See, that, that speaks to the reality of the sin nature in all of us. The Bible says we're all rebels following deceived hearts that make us depart from the best thing of all God and run away from him. You say, oh yeah, my child is good. He's got a good heart and he just needs to find himself. But if you're saying that, you're deceived by your own emotions, not by what the Bible actually says. The Bible says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3, 23. And it says this, all we like sheep have gone astray. All of us, not just teens, adults too. Everyone, we have turned away, every one of us to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Neither you nor your child has any reason to be confident in oneself. You are sinners that deserve judgment from a holy and perfect God. Why be confident in self when you're heading to utter destruction by being you and following your own deceitful heart? Friends, that's not a way to be confident in life. Confidence in your life comes from this verse. Trust the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs 3, 5. Our confidence is found in his goodness, not in our own. What about self-consciousness? 
Merriam-Webster defines self-consciousness as a state of being aware of oneself as an individual. It often involves being uncomfortably conscious of one as the object of observation by others. See, self-consciousness is the fear of what others think of you. Here's the reality. I hope teens you'll hear this. Most people are not thinking of you. They are narcissistically thinking about themselves. To really care all that much about you. We worry about what they think as if it matters. They are a mist here for a minute. They, whoever they are. Eternally, we should be more concerned about what an eternal God thinks of us. The Bible says this, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. Proverbs 29, 25. The fear of man lays a trap, friends. But whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. If you're self-conscious, man's opinion is probably your God, not God himself. God is always a greater threat to us than any man's opinion or action. You want to understand yourself? Do not fear the perception of man or even yourself. The Bible says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and knowledge of the Holy One is insight. We fear ourselves or our kids not being confident because of our cultural values. But we really should fear the one who can kill and can make alive. Jesus says, and do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather, fear him who can destroy both soul and and body in hell. If you're not being his witness because you are not self-confident enough, will that be an excuse for worshiping the wrong God? The people's opinion of you? Isn't God's opinion what's more important? I personally grew up with a strong value of self-confidence. My father was a psychologist and, you know, my parents did good to try to make me confident. And at one point I was very cocky and successful in the eyes of the world, but nothing was working in my life. My marriage was failing, my finances were in shambles because of my arrogant decisions with my money. And I was constantly fearful of God's judgment because I was constantly making decisions that I knew he didn't approve of morally. To the world, I was a a confident guy. I used to actually have a word for it. I called it blind confidence. I I was successful with some things because I did not let fear rule me because I believed I could overcome anything with myself with enough effort. But things were a mess. And I started to realize there was just not enough time left in my life or effort that could fix the broken mess I confidently landed myself in. Then I met some true followers of Jesus. And immediately I noticed they had something different than I had. They had something called a quiet confidence Man, it was something I I just did not have. My confidence wasn't quiet. It was messy. Kathy's laughing. She knows. But they had peace. They had peace. No matter what the circumstances of their lives, they were confident in something that was not about themselves. Their their confidence came from a God who loved them and promised good to them. It it, it seemed unshakable while my confidence was like a house of cards and the next wind was going to blow it down. And one day, I put my trust in God's love for me 
as proved in his son, Jesus Christ. And friends, now I am truly confident. No matter what the storm, no matter what others think of me, because my confidence is not based on me or on myself. The fear of man sometimes, honestly, can still trouble me. But ultimately, in my heart, I fear God more. The Apostle Paul said, if God is for us, who can be against us? And and while self-consciousness is is not good, self-awareness is important. There's a difference between self-awareness and self-confidence. To not be deceived by our hearts, we must be aware that we all sin against a holy God. The Bible says if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us, 1 John 1, 8. Saying we have no sins is false confidence based on something in ourselves. Living like that is dangerous because it's living in opposition to the truth of life. The Bible also says this. If if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Friends, what is your confession today? That you're confident in yourself? Or are you confident in God? You may be a very confident person. You may be a very moral person. You may be a very successful person in the eyes of the world. But if you are not conscious of your sin, you are not aware that you fall short of the glory of God and that you deserve judgment, you will then, if you do not become conscious or self-aware of that, you will not turn to the one who is truly faithful and is truly trustworthy and will forgive you and redeem you. He is the one that can remove all your sin, all your shame, and give you confident, lasting peace, no matter what you have done, no matter what you have left undone. Don't be self-conscious of your failings. You are made of dust. How can one piece of dust be better than another piece of dust? But beloved, be confident of this. He has formed you from the dust. He has made you into his own image that's of infinite worth. Friends, self-confidence is not what makes us love. It's the enemy of love. I'll close with some of the Apostle Paul's words. He wrote this in 2 Philippians 3. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourself. Does does that sound like the goal of life is self-confidence? Your life is not about what you want, friends. It's not about what your kids want. It's about giving others what they want, love and respect. It's not you be you and damn the rest of the other mutations that are not bright as shiny as me and expressing themselves the way I want to express myself. It's about loving all he created out of the dust. Paul says, let each of you look not only to his own interest, but also to the interest of others. Philippians 2, 4. We live for our own interests. And, And when we're not confident in ourselves, we constantly need to have to build ourselves up and That's in opposition to building up others. The battle is not to have a mind that is self-confident because we are so great. The battle is to have a mind that knows how great he is and that it is his greatness that ultimately makes us confident. Jesus said, have this mind among yourselves, which is in Christ Jesus. Though he was in the form of God, did not account did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Here, here's Jesus. He was truly great. He had no sin. He had nothing to be ashamed of ever. He had the power in his fingertips that created the very universe that we live in. He was God. 
And yet that did not increase his self-image. He feared God, knowing that that is where his true confidence came from. It says, but he emptied himself, taking on the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, Philippians 2.7. Instead of being all that he could be, you be you. Jesus, being the Son of God, King of all kings, emptied himself of everything. And he was confident doing it. He knew who he was. But he was not self-confident. He emptied himself in anything of this world that would make him self-confident in himself. He was confident in his father and his father's plan for him. Jesus acted as if he were dust. And he served us the other dust and being found in human form he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death even on a cross philippians 2 8 he knew how truly good he was but instead of bartering his goodness for power and influence in the world he gave his goodness away his goodness beyond measure he gave away by obediently dying the most painful death, most disgracing death possible on a Roman cross. Dying that way gave no one a good self-image or good self-confidence. The whole world saw him as cursed and despised for dying in such a shameful way. But he humbled himself to it in obedience to his Father's love for us. Isaiah 53 says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken and smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. Friends, the healing of your self-esteem issues comes from realizing how much it was necessary that he emptied himself for you. It doesn't come from building up yourself. It comes from understanding how much he emptied himself because he loved you. He willingly received the punishment for your sin so that you and me the guilty could go free and, and live confidently without any eternal judgment. Beloved, stop putting your confidence on anything in this flesh. That's what the apostle Paul says. Don't put any confidence in the things of this flesh. What your heart says about who you are and how important you are. Put your confidence in a God who says you are valued. Someone so valued, he was willing to empty himself of all power and die for you. Friends, there's no reason to be self-conscious. You are loved by the one who truly matters. Be confident in that. Because he's proved it. He proved it by rising on the third day, showing you that your sin was defeated that the power of the enemy, death, was destroyed forever. And, and Satan's power to deceive us about our value and our worth by making us lust after the confidence of the flesh was, was extinguished. Jesus did not focus on a life of being self-confident. Instead, he confidently served all at whatever expense to himself. And God esteemed him. He didn't have self-esteem. He had God esteem. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Can I hear an amen? amen. Spend your life praising him, not yourself. Beloved, 
find true confidence in this life and for all eternity, repent of your sins. Repent of your self-aggrandizing need for self-confidence and turn and follow Jesus. Have the mind of Christ. Have a confidence in God's love for you. Have confidence in that. You are created in his image. You are brought forth and redeemed by his blood. You are vindicated by his spirit. You are forgiven of all your sin and you are given eternal life. May the Holy Spirit make you today God conscious, not self conscious. Make him give you a conscious reality of your own sins against a holy God. Conscious of his eternal love for you, that he's loved you since before the foundations of this world and decided to redeem you. And that he would not even spare his own son, the price of his own son, because you have so much worth to him. Be conscious today that his love demands a response. For he is coming soon. Do not delay by pursuing gain of your own self-confidence and becoming lost. Today, empty yourself, humble yourself before him and be found in him. Let us pray. Father, Thank you for your word. It reminds us when we're departing into our own philosophies and the philosophies of the world, world philosophies of the flesh that will leave us bankrupt, will leave us lost, will leave us without anything. Father, let us recognize today our sin and turn to you and fi find true confidence in your love for us. For you have proved it. You have done what we cannot do. You have paid a price we cannot pay. But we can be confident that you did it. And from that confidence that we are created by you and loved by you, we can go out and do great things in this world that you may be glorified, that you may be lifted up. Lord, build up the parents of this church, build up the people of this church, build up the youth of our church to focus their hearts on you. Father, if there's anybody here today that needs to repent, let them come to you right now and admit their sin. Let them be convicted of how good and loving you are to redeem them from it. And Father, let them turn and follow you. And if they choose to do that, Lord says the angels of heaven are rejoicing. Oh Father, may you rejoice greatly today in your children following your ways. I pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen.